We all live under capitalism, even in allegedly communist countries like China or Cuba, for instance. But in the grand scheme of things, capitalism isn't really that old. Who will define for us the term capital? It's so recent, we can know in detail what life was like before it. Join now a group of young people at the National Education Program Workshop, Arkansas. Exactly where and when you're talking about makes a huge difference, but let's go through a few different times and places and see what life was like for those that had the pleasure of living through it. In this video, I'll show you what the system was like in Western Europe and China and the surprisingly different routes they took to get to the modern world we see now. Let's start with Western Europe between 400 and 1400 AD. I know that's a massive time range, but it's quite a nice time span to show how the world changed in that era. Much of this has been referred to as the Dark Ages. The discussion on whether they actually were dark is a long and complicated one, but let's just say that I don't personally buy into the idea that everything was suddenly worse for everyone for 1000 or so years. Anyway, why 400-ish AD? Around this time, a little thing called the fall of the Roman Empire happened. I may or may not have made a video on this already. So-called barbarians take control of parts of the empire and for a while, not much changes. They want to act like the Roman emperors that came before them. But as the empire continues to fall apart, it wasn't a big one-off event. Honestly, I've made a video that gets into this in more detail, but sadly, no one ever watched it. As I was saying, as the empire continues to fall apart, things like taxes start to dry up. How can these barbarians pay their armies and keep control. Easy. If you own lots of land, pay them with control of some of it. Those people then have people who live on their land. So for the average person, you had a bit of land and some people had more or less land than you. Some people had way more land than you, but nearly everyone had land. And that's because nearly everyone was a soldier. This wasn't a time to have lots of bureaucrats who could run things for you, like there were in the Roman Empire. Everyone had to be able to fight to protect their plot of land. This kind of trundles along for around 250 years, and then a certain man called Charlemagne was born. Maybe you've heard of him. If you haven't, don't worry. Here's the Cliff Notes version. He conquered most of what we would call France, Germany, and Italy, and called himself King of the Franks. Hence, France being called France. He wants to restore the Western Roman Empire, which had only fallen a few hundred years before. I promise, this is the last time I'll heavily hint that you should watch my video about this after I finish watching this one. He didn't manage to unify the empire, but he still had a massive empire to run. And that's very hard if it's just one man running it. So like the barbarians before him, he had other people control land under him. They were called vassals, nothing new. They get titles like count. Things are becoming more formal. It's worth stating that although since the end of the Roman Empire people have been given land, it's not one nice complete plot of land. Sometimes it could even be spread over several modern day countries. And the interesting change here is what happens when our man Charlemagne dies. Charlemagne's empire doesn't last much beyond his death. That's not the point of this video. What's important though, are the wars that happened between his descendants for more than 100 years after he died. Many of these counts supported one descendant over the other. And depending on who won or lost, you either got more land or lost land, but it's still very split up and hard to defend. But this is where the change happens. After things settle down, those counts demand they be given large plots of land to control and defend. And let's call them counties. Then once they have this status of holding large plots of land, they do their best to stop others climbing up above them. And this is the point when what we call feudalism has really taken control, at least in this part of Europe. And for most of the next 400 years, small things change, but not much for the average person. They work their small plot of land mostly to survive. They have to give their count or duke or whatever they're called anything they ask for. That is until three things come along to shatter feudalism. First, a little thing called the Black Death emerges in 1346. There's not a solid estimate on the death toll, but between 40 to 60% of Europeans die in around seven years. But on the other side of it, the people at the bottom of this social order start to demand more money for what they do. Some of them start to earn quite a bit, and in some cases, they become richer than the counts who control them. Until now, we focused on Western European feudalism, but not England specifically. But England is crucial to how feudalism started to crumble and capitalism rose in its place. In England, the counts fight back and laws are passed to limit wages, but the direction things are going in is clear. The second major event is English specific, the War of the Roses. We really won't get into the detail of this one here because it's worth a video on its own. It's a long event and lots of counts and dukes are on one side or the other. At the end of it, Henry VII comes from absolutely nowhere with no real claim to the throne and wins it. 
One of the first major things he does is make it difficult for the Counts to be able to challenge him. He stops them having their own armies separate to his. The third and final nail in the coffin of feudalism is the English Civil War. At the end of it, Charles I is executed, and there's a kind of republic for a while under Cromwell. So kings are getting weaker and lords etc become weaker too. But then when Cromwell dies, Charles' son Charles becomes Charles II, and lords come back. But when he dies, his brother James becomes king. He's Catholic, and you may know that's been a bit of a problem since Henry VIII stopped England being Catholic. Parliament gets worried he'll force England to become Catholic. And so they invite his daughter Mary and her husband William of Orange. Gij noemt u zelf een verheven vorst, maar he was Dutch, to invade and take his place. Because they're not Catholic. But there's one real condition. From now on, all the real power is in Parliament's hands. Parliament's existed for a while by the stage and has gone through ups and downs in terms of how powerful it is, but from now on, Parliament is on top. This means that from now on, inherited feudal positions start to mean less and less, whilst people without their high and mighty titles earn more money than those lords. Capitalism was fully on the rise, and over the next few hundred years, really took hold over most of the world, as did Britain, which formed not long after William and Mary taking control. But that's the story for another day. And now we move on to China, which was somewhere that was not at all like Western Europe. Now, in this case, we could talk about thousands of years of history, but that might be a bit much. The crucial thing is that China never really had feudalism. Instead, they had a huge bureaucratic system. You also had an emperor, but all of the real job of running the country was by these bureaucrats. To become one, during most of imperial Chinese history, you had to pass an exam. So theoretically, anyone could become one. In reality, the test is crazy hard and you need a specific tutor or to be from a family that was in the bureaucracy already. But aside from that, anyone can rise up. We'll start with the Song Dynasty, which lasted from 970 to 1270. The reason we start with them is because it's often considered proto-capitalist, hundreds of years before European capitalism. And in this period, a huge amount of technical progress was being made. For example, movable print typeface, mechanical water clocks, paddle wheel ships, magnetic compasses, water-powered textile production, large transport ships. Two of those are things that Europeans will absolutely need to change their world in the future. Movable type for the printing press and the compass, which is one of the most important inventions of all time. And then, at some point, this guy called Genghis Khan starts conquering the people around Song China. Then he starts to conquer the Song a bit. Then he dies, and China isn't the focus so much for his sons and grandsons. That is, until one of his grandsons, Kublai Khan, eventually completes the job and becomes Emperor of China himself. He founds the Yuan Dynasty, which is the Mongol dynasty of China. Some things change, like what is now Beijing becomes the capital, but a lot of stuff stays the same. Except trade with people outside of China booms. This is because Kublai's family control most of Central Asia and what we now call Russia and Ukraine. This connects Europe to China in a pretty unprecedented way. Although it's by no means the origin of the Silk Road, but it was the largest version of what we now call the Silk Road at this point in history. So money can be made through trading advanced Chinese goods, and Chinese manufacturing was way, way ahead. A brief mention that the Mongols control Crimea, and a lot of these trade goods end up there. Small city-states in what is now Italy, Venice and Genoa in particular, start to trade with the Mongols and become stupid rich. This is the beginning of the end of feudalism in mainland Europe. Because this trade route is how the Black death spread into Europe. Italy first, and then it went wild. Anyway, back to China. The Mongol system is dominated by trade. They get rich from it. You get rich from it. They didn't care too much what background you had, but what you could do was way more important. Kind of capitalism? But the Mongols don't last forever. When the Ming rise up and take control of China, they go in the opposite direction. They minimize contact with the outside world. They build the Great Wall of China to stop people like the Mongols taking control again. Spoiler, this doesn't work, as the next and final dynasty the Qing were nomads from the north, and someone just let them in through the wall. But I digress. Under Ming and then Qing, things stay mostly the same. That is, until Britain and other Europeans start turning up and trying to trade with them. Britain really wants tea. They can't get enough of the stuff, and still can't. And China has most of the known tea in the world at the time. By this time, we're into the Industrial Revolution in Britain, and so they demo all the fancy manufactured goods like glass and pottery that they have. The Chinese are unimpressed and don't want that in exchange for tea. The only way they will give the British tea is in return for gold and silver, something they do not want to do as it will reduce their own reserves. But they have no choice. They pay in silver and gold. But being the arch imperialists they are, they come up with a crazy scheme. Sell loads of opium in China. Some of their citizens start to become addicts and the Qing dynasty gets very f***ed off. So what do they do? They destroy lots of the opium. The English merchants who are trading it cry to the British parliament that their property has been destroyed. Boo hoo. 
And the British government acts all chill, there's nothing they can do here. Nah, they send the army and win a quick war we call the First Opium War. Britain gets Hong Kong as a result. Then 14 years later, another similar thing happens and Britain, the USA and France attack Qing China this time. Britain strengthens its hold on Hong Kong and can trade in other places like Shanghai. Meanwhile, British style capitalism has been creeping in and it's too late. China has been ruined and will collapse before eventually joining back together and becoming communist. That is until it decides to become kinder capitalist in the 80s under Deng Xiaoping. And earlier, you may have noticed I mentioned a certain video that had been made around the Roman Empire and how it collapsed over a very long period and has different definitions of when you could say it collapsed. Maybe that piqued your interest. If so, watch this video to see exactly how and when the Roman Empire ended. There are two possible dates, maybe even three. Decide for yourself.